You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. The product that we produce here has unique advantages to going into the EV battery market. We think that's not quite well understood yet. And so what we can disclose about this study when it is complete, and we will be able to disclose some parameters of it, I think we'll demonstrate that to the market. And importantly, it's a study that will be available certainly under uh, confidentiality agreements that we might sign with any you know, strategic counterparties, whether those be large mining companies or, uh, frankly, participants in the downstream of the battery market, which are the major battery makers and the major car makers here in North America. Welcome back to Mining Stock Education. I'm your host, Bill Powers. In today's show, we're getting an update from FPX Nickel, one of our sponsors. FPX's website is fpxnickel.com, ticker symbol in Toronto, FPX, very simple. And in the States on the OTC, FPOCF. We're chatting with Martin Turin. He's the president, CEO, and director. Martin, welcome back onto the program. And you've been plugging away at your Baptiste uh, Nickel Project in British Columbia. You're announcing a scoping study that you're going to be initiating, as well as some metallurgical results in future testing. Uh, talk to us about what these results will mean if you're successful. And also, what is metallurgy for newer resource investors? Yeah, good to talk to you, Bill. So that's a pretty big question to delve into here in a short podcast. But you know, metallurgy to, basically refers to the process of taking the target mineral out of the host rock into a product that you can actually sell in the market. A lot of our market, I think, here in the junior mining space really focuses on things like the grade of, of the target mineral in the deposit. And, and you probably spend a lot of time with other companies talking about that. And that's obviously fundamentally important. But just as important is how you take that target mineral out of that host rock and, and do it as cheaply as possible to produce as high value a product as possible. So, you know, in, in it, to try to put it as briefly as, as, as I can, that's kind of what metallurgy is focused on is once you've got that target mineral, um, how do you get it out and how do you sell it? Uh, in terms of the scoping work that we're looking at, yeah, we're, we're, we're focused on the advancement of the Baptiste deposit in British Columbia. It's one of the world's largest nickel deposits. And the nickel is hosted in our deposit in a relatively novel mineral. That mineral is called awarowite. Uh, it's a nickel where nickel is hosted in a form uh, where it's bound with iron. Uh, so the deposit itself is pretty moderate uh, grade in terms of what's there in situ. However, this mineral has certain properties to it that allow it to be extracted quite cheaply and to produce a very high value product. So this scoping study will look at our ability to produce a product that would go into the EV battery market and happy to get into a bit more detail on that here as we go. And Martin, why did you uh, announce a scoping study? Because in Australia, they call what we in North America call a preliminary economic assessment. They say scoping study and scoping study kind of indicates more internal or are you going to publish this as well? So we have produced a preliminary economic assessment or PEA on the project uh, in September of 2020 that envisioned the production of a concentrate that would eventually go into the stainless steel market. This internal scoping study that we've just uh, announced that we're embarking on here, to your point, it is going to be an internal document for the time being, but it will look at taking that concentrate and instead of going into the stainless steel market with it, we think that there's certain advantages that this uh, mineralogy has to producing a very high value product, a very clean product for the EV battery market. So this study will look at that as an alternative as we move into the next stages of you know, a uh, major milestone for the project, which is the, the delivery of a preliminary feasibility study, which, we'd, we w- which we would envision here over the next uh, year and a half or so. There are many who say the PEA is simply a marketing document. Uh, with the scoping study, would this be essentially a marketing document with scientific background and you know justification for a potential battery supplier, essentially? Uh, not really. We wouldn't look at it as, at it as a marketing document. Um, I think part of us doing this and announcing this is really um, you know, demonstrating to the market and to potential strategic counterparties that the product that we produce here has unique advantages to going into the EV battery market. We think that's not quite well understood yet. And so what we can disclose about this study when it is complete, and we will be able to disclose some parameters of it, I think we'll demonstrate that to the market. 
And importantly, it's a study that will be available certainly under uh, confidentiality agreements that we might sign with any you know, strategic counterparties, whether those be large mining companies or, uh, frankly, participants in the downstream of the battery market, which are the major battery makers and the major car makers here in North America. So your press release said this is a more simplified metallurgical flow sheet than some other nickel ores. In layman's term, can you break down that down for us? Yeah. So getting nickel from host rock and getting in, into the chemical form that's required for EV batteries is a long, complicated, costly process. No matter whether you're starting with sulfide ores or laterite ores, and those are the two, two main sort of mineralogical types of, of existing nickel deposits. So there's an interesting figure, I think, in, in, this, in the uh, news release that we've put out that shows sort of a simplified flow sheet uh, and the number of stages that have to be gone through from ore to the battery uh, for the production of nickel sulfate, which is the, the battery chemical that you need to make for the EVs. And as you can see in that flow sheet, the number of stages from the mine to the battery for this wearaway nickel that we have with FPX is, 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 is diminished. There are some stages, uh, particularly around smelting, that our product can skip going to the unique cleanliness of the host rock and therefore the unique cleanliness of the concentrate that we produce. So um, uh, where the, the alternative forms of nickel supply uh, come with significant capex and opex to produce nickel sulfate, we think we might have some economic advantages and also some carbon emission advantages over those feedstocks to producing nickel for, for the EV batteries uh, going forward. Your end user or potential end user, do you expect it to be North American? Certainly, we think that if these units end up in the EV battery market and, and you know, with every passing month, we, we certainly become more firmly of the view that that is where these nickel units will end up, given increasing battery demand. Uh, we do think that it will be in North America. Um, you know, the North American auto industry faces a significant challenge, as everyone knows, to electrify their fleets over the next several years. All of the North American automakers have announced very ambitious plans to do so and have started to make upstream investments into um, the battery plants, into the chemical plants that need to be built. And there will be a significant pull on nickel units from those North American automakers uh, because without it, they just simply won't be able to execute on their business plan. And would you have to send your ore to Asia for further processing before it arrives back to North America? We would not. That's the beauty here is that, um, you know, over the last year or so, we've we've had, you know, a lot of conversations with battery makers and car makers. And, you know, one of the aspects of those discussions is for us to understand what their product flows are. You know, when they when they when they receive nickel uh, and put it into their batteries, you know, they can draw for us the journey that that nickel unit has gone on. And typically that involves that goes through, you know, three or four different companies hands in oftentimes three or four different countries. So between the, 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 the mine itself, ultimately to getting into the battery, um, it's, it's typically a long and very expensive journey for that particular nickel unit. The, 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 the real advantage that we have given our location in British Columbia in Canada here is, <laughs> excuse me, a very direct path to producing nickel and to having real ease of transport, either by truck, by rail, or by ocean freight to a host of ports and to a host of battery plants that are being either operated currently in the U.S. or that are planned to be built over the next several years. So we've been talking about Baptiste and the developments there from an engineering and metallurgical standpoint, but you also had a new discovery, which you confirmed at the Van Target. So give us an update here, please. Yeah, so um, in uh, starting in last fall, fall of 2021, we started to announce the results of uh, the Maiden or the first ever drill program at that Van Target which is located about six kilometers away from Baptiste, which, as I mentioned, Baptiste is one of the largest nickel deposits in the world. That initial drill program at Van was very successful, and it definitely uh, confirmed to us the thesis that Van could ultimately host a nickel deposit that is larger and or higher grade than Baptiste. So we're really moving the company along in two parallel tracks. On track one, we've got our heads down. We're moving Baptiste through to a preliminary feasibility study and then ultimately through the, through, through the ensuing project development steps that would go beyond that. Um, 
The other track, though, is really being led by our kind of exploration team, and they're very excited and focused on expansion of what we have delineated already at Van and trying to really prove up that thesis that it could ultimately be a better deposit than Baptiste. So it's a, it's a very exciting time for the company in, in both of those respects. And would you expect a lot of the met, met work that you're doing now could be applied to what you're finding at Van? Yeah, we what we're seeing in the core at Van it is that it appears to be sort of a carbon copy of the mineralization that we see at Baptiste. So a lot of sort of uh, killing two birds with one stone, we believe, with all the met work that we're doing. And treasury and burn rate, uh, where are we uh, with in regards to that, Martin? Yeah, so the company has just over 14 million in Canadian in the bank. Uh, we're fully funded through 2022 and into into 2023 with that, um, and so we're in a really good position where we're not having to raise money. Of course, like any company, we'll always look at opportun- opportunistic uh, opportunities to raise money. You know, we do have active conversations with a host of you know potential strategic counterparts right now that may or may not yield an investment or some type of partnership. That's something that's a bit of a wild card that I would encourage investors to kind of watch this space for. Martin, you know, especially on social media, a lot of people made money speculating on AMC and GME uh, last year. Uh, Silver speculators want to see a silver squeeze. How prone or how possible would it be to see a squeeze in nickel? I'd say it's very possible, um, high likelihood of that happening at some point over the next couple of years. And in fact, people have been talking about a bit of a nickel squeeze, uh, even in recent weeks, where you've seen a few factors coming together. You've seen a significant drawdown in visible inventories on the LME and the other exchange warehouses globally, to the point where the market is starting to get tighter and tighter. Um, you're also seeing huge draw on those units from those EV battery makers and car makers. I think they are pre pre purchasing a lot of that material to hold it privately because they fear, you know, the, the lack of access to nickel units going forward to, to meet on their business plans. Um, the other part of the nickel industry, I think that leaves it prone to wild swings, both up and down is the small size of the market. You know, it's a, the nickel market is about a tenth of the size of the copper market. So, you know, swings at the margin in terms of demand supply have a much bigger impact proportionally on nickel than they do on copper. And and as you know, the smaller the market, the easier it is to, to for financial players to organize sort of um, uh, squeezes either on the on the long side or on the short side. So it's it, it's a market that has that is inherently highly volatile and that's high risk, high reward. And it could be of particular interest to speculators to look at it for that reason. When we saw cobalt, which is in batteries, uh, go parabolic in 2018, then it was quickly substituted out. But you've told me in the past that nickel can't be substituted out as quickly if the price does skyrocket, right? That's right. I mean, one of the big reasons that you know nickel was able to, they were able to increase the amount of nickel in favor of cobalt when the cobalt price got too high is that not just that nickel is is cheaper than cobalt on a on a per unit basis, but it has higher energy density. And that is the key property of nickel that makes it so prominent in these EV batteries. The higher the energy density means the longer the range of the vehicle, or of the longer the range that battery uh, keeps its charge. And also the faster the charging time is or the fill up time is, is, is reduced, the more nickel that you have. And we know consumers, particularly North American consumers, are going to want to have the longest range possible and they're going to want to have their vehicles get charged up as quickly as possible. Those two things can't happen without a lot of nickel in the battery. And don't you think the, the battery market that supplies these EVs, it's exponential growth we're looking at because on an anecdotal level, I saw on social media a woman with a 2012 Tesla said she the car runs great, but they told me I need to replace the battery. The battery is twenty two thousand dollars, which is almost like buying a whole new car. So you're having going to have all the battery replacements in addition to all the new vehicles hitting the market too, right? You will, and but the good thing about um, EV batteries is that you can recover m- the vast majority of the metal units in those batteries, and so you have a bit of a circular economy that gets created, which is great because in the absence of that, you just simply would not have enough metal supply going forward to have everyone driving EVs. So the circularity of those of those units is great, both for, from an environmental standpoint and from the standpoint of of underpinning sort of the long term growth of the sector. But to your point on the exponential growth, 
and you have the Biden administration that is pushing for 50% of new car sales to be EVs by 2030. I'll ask you the question now, Bill. How, what percentage of new car sales in the United States right now are EVs? Isn't it like 5%, if I recall? There is a Tesla no, deal. Go ahead. <laughs> it's, it's, it's 2%. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So there's a huge sort of, uh, uh, you know, coming leg up in, in EV demand in the United States alone in order to meet those targets. And, and you know, whether those targets can be met, I think, is going to be a function largely of the availability of the metal supply that goes in them. But don't you think it'll be 5% this year because you got the Ford truck coming online. I think GMC has a truck coming online. Hopefully they fix the Chevy Bolt, which that battery was exploding on people, which wasn't good from a marketing perspective. I mean, what are the estimations for this year though? Do you know? I think, I think you're right. I think it is closer to 5% for sure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, the website is fpxnickel.com. Martin is advancing this project uh, with the hopes of finding a a suitor someday, right? Martin, you're not going to plan on mining this yourself. You're you're eventually teeing this up for a potential buyer. Absolutely. This is, uh, this is a deposit already that could be one of the 10 largest nickel mines in the, in the world in terms of annual output and could uh, support a mine life in excess of 35 years junior companies don't own these things all the way to production. They just simply do not. And that, that is the ultimate, I think, path for us. All right. Ticker symbol in Toronto, FPX, and in the States, F-P-O-C-F. Martin, thank you for this update. Thanks, Bill. Good to see you again. <laughs>